Today on the show, I am joined by Christian De La Huerta. He is a spiritual teacher, a personal transformation coach, an award-winning author, and a TEDx speaker. So hello there, Christian. Hi, Shelley. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I, I appreciate it and I'm honored and delighted. Bless you. I'm delighted that I think I said your name right. You said it beautifully. I said, oh, that's the hardest part of the show over, if I'm honest, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Be easy for me. Now on in. So bless you. You have this most amazing book, which Thank I can you. only say comes from a most amazing story. So please do share the life of Christian. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. You know, I say that I'm an interesting person to be speaking about personal empowerment um, and what it means to live a heroic life, because I, my, I was born in Cuba in a communist country and lived there for 10 years. And, you know, most people, I think, would realize would know that in a, kind of, a communist country, there's very little personal power, like, right, you're pretty much owned by the state and the state tells you what to do and owns everything about, you know, it's your property, there's no private property. and um, so, and then we're also, I was also uh, raised in a very Catholic family. So another very hierarchical power over institution. Um, and so, and, and I was really painfully shy. Like part of my personal stories, I was, my parents were involved in counter revolutionary activity. So there was like real danger. A lot of their friends were, you know, were killed or, or spent years and years in, in jail, in prison for as political prisoners. And so there was this kind of implicit message of not showing up too much, kind of like blending in the background so that you wouldn't be seen too much. And so one benefit of that, of my upraising, is that I, we, we, we had TV, but there was nothing worth watching. So we grew up reading. So I, I became a really good student. I have developed this lifelong love affair with books. And we also were, you know, invented our own, our own games. And sad to me to see all these kids with their nose in their screens and their phones and, and, and their games. Um, because we grew up outside and inventing, creating pastimes. And for that, I'm really grateful. I was a really good student. I had a pretty much, a, you know, what here in the States we call a 4.0. I had all top, top grades, all A's except for 1B which is, you know, 80 to 90th percentile. And I didn't do this intentionally, but looking back on it, I know that I subconsciously sabotage my grade point average so that I wouldn't have to get up in front of an auditorium filled with hundreds of people to deliver the valedictory speech. There was just no way, no way that that point in my life that I would have been ready to do that. And, and what's a testament to the teachings and to the message of this book is that we can overcome all of our past obstacles and traumas and all of that stuff can be healed. And today, um, you know, I'm a international speaker. I speak all over the world. I spoke on the TEDx stage. I get paid to deliver keynotes in universities and, and I've done a bunch of those. Um, so, so that's part of what I, what I write about in this book, that there is a way that we can reclaim our power. And, and express it in a way that is a match that is congruent with who we are. I love that. It's such a big leap, isn't it, to go from like an introvert way, almost, as you said, purposely sort of trying to fail so you don't have to go up on that stage. That's real like crippling, I don't know what the word is, but you just don't want to get out there on the stage. Now you're like a speaker. Yeah. And you talk about this power, you didn't have the power because it's a communist country and things like that. But what does the word power mean to you when you use the word power? You know, and that's a, that's a really you know big question too, because a lot of us have an ambivalent relationship to power, um, and I'm talking now here about personal power, um, and you know because we we have that conflicted relationship with it because you know all we have to do is like turn on the news on any given day or glance through the morning headlines online. And we witness at least one abuse of power a day. And, and so good-hearted people don't want to do that. <laughs> we don't want to abuse power. Then combined with the fact that we've been conditioned to believe that power is a bad thing, you know, with quotes like power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So who wants to be corrupted? What they didn't tell us about that quote, though, is that Lord Acton was, was speaking specifically about political power not the interpersonal human power that we're talking about here. So add to that mix, the fact that we, we've been conditioned to believe that the emotions are weakness um, and that 
you know, we, we hate conflict, we run away from confrontations. And when you put all that together, what happens is we end up giving our power away, our inherent power that nobody can give to us and no one can take away from us. We are the only ones that give it away. And we settle for 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 like illusion of security we we play small for um a, a false sense of acceptance and for crumbs for morsels of pseudo love and it's not an effective strategy no it is interesting i think the word power is used differently like when you think of political power and like war power it is very as you say destructive we've got this personal power but you said about giving your power away and I think we do I know it's kind of human nature that we always think what do you think what would you do but I think even when it comes to choices in our life when we're asking the opinions of others it is almost giving away our personal power on a level there as well yes and you know in in the romance languages the word power and, and in other languages too like in Spanish uh, which is in you know, my native tongue power Poder means both power and it also means to be able to. So, so there's this, to me, when I think about power is, is this ability to be who we are, this, this way to choose who we are in the world and to give full expression to that. And, and, you know, there isn't anyone in this world, in this universe or any other universe who has, who has the same kind of genetics, the same set of experiences that make each one of us unique. And if we don't give full expression to that, right, like fully in our power, nobody else is going to do it. So it's up to us to, 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 to create that expression, to, to step into our power and to be, all, to, to be who we are wherever we are. That's brilliant. So how do you go from being an introvert who can't stand the thought of getting onto a stage to embracing that personal power and then totally rocking the stage with like your TEDx talks, transformational coach, you do breath work, you do so much on the stage. What was the bridge between them? Yeah, and, and it's a great, you know, it's like I didn't have the methodology, like I didn't understand what I was doing then. Um, but but I do now, like because we most of us are allowed, we, we give our power away to our fears right into the fear of rejection, fear of survival, fear of ending up alone, right? Oh, fear of failure, fear of success. Um, and, and so we, we, that's the, we, stuff, we stuff ourselves into tiny little boxes, all our huge, magnificent potential. We, we stuff it into little boxes and, and, and walk around as if that's who we were. Um, and, and we get confused about fear. We think that to be fearless means that we, we no longer feel fear. What fearlessness means is that we feel the fear and we override that, we transcend it, we refuse to give our power to that fear. And so we do it anyway. And, and there's a book written by a woman named Susan Jeffers that I reference in, in, in my book about power. And, and here it is in 30 seconds. You know, imagine concentric circles, right? So the, the, the inner circle represents our comfort zone. This is where we are comfortable now being with ourselves in the world, being with others, being in relationship to life. Every time we take a little step, and it could be a tiny baby step, and we force ourselves, you know, we put ourselves in a little bit of a, a little bit of discomfort, a little bit of risk. And we're talking here about psychological and emotional risk, not survival risk. But every time we do that, we, we establish ourselves in that next level of comfort zone. So looking back on it, that's what I did. I always had a sense of mission. And so I, I knew that if I was going to fulfill that sense of mission, that I had a, you know, a deep sense of purpose in that I wanted to make a difference in, in, in human lives and make a difference in this world, um, I knew I had to get over this fear of speaking in public. So I signed up for a, a course in, in public speaking right out of college. And for 14 weeks, I hated it, detested it, because every Thursday night, I'd have to get up and give three two-minute speeches. Come Monday, I was already, you know, angsting and worried about it and what I'm going to say and, um, you know, all that self-inflicted mind F that we do in ourselves, that, that harsh self judgment um, and, and the futurizing, worrying about what may or may not happen or being stuck in the past. So I was, you know, that was doing that number, but, it, but what happened, you know, after like midway through the course of a seventh, eighth week, it stopped being such a big deal. 
and, and because that's what I was doing, right? Every time I got up, I would stretch my, my comfort zone a little bit at a time, a little bit more, a little bit more. And if we would commit to doing that, just do something, whether it's say yes and go on a coffee date, right? Override our fear. Say yes and go on that interview. Do something new that you've been wanting to do, but have been holding yourself back to do. If we would do that even a tiny, tiny step every week, after 52 weeks, we're going to be way out here in terms of our comfort zone. And, and that's the easiest way. Well, maybe the simplest way. It's not always easy, right? Because we're still stretching ourselves. And that's why, to me, this is a heroic journey, right? That's why this book is part of a series of three about what it means to live heroically in the 21st century. Um, because if we, want, if we want to step into our power, if we want to fulfill our potential, if we want to have relationships that work, we've got to be willing to look inside and, and, and ask the questions and understand the patterns and why we do the things we do so that we can break free from those patterns and choose who we want to be and, 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 and how. I was smiling as you were saying about, you know, how far you come in like 52 weeks, because just like March in 2020, I had this book from like 2018, Positive Change and self Kick book. But my son made me realize not everyone reads. So he goes, oh, if you made it into a podcast, I'd like listen to your message. And then like you, I've had that inner nickel for years. I'm on a mission. I want to make the world a better place. I'm really passionate about mental health and overcoming it. And so like just over 52 weeks ago, I took my book, which I love doing because it was just behind a screen. Nobody knows what I look like into <laughs> launching a podcast. But then I have to use my voice. And I was like, painfully shy as a child mm. but in the past 52 weeks I've gone from a solo show just me and my book no camera and then I've got guests but still no camera and now you know a year later it's like a podcast show with guests we've got the camera I'm doing Facebook lives we're going into coaching we've been on zoom calls <laughs> and you just think if you'd have told me 52 weeks ago you've got the power within you I'd have been nice. Uh, thanks for no thanks. I'm busy that day and the next 52, <laughs> you know, but we do have this power, but I wouldn't have known of my potential or my service to others if I was stuck in that first stage of the comfort zone. And it's yes. a real effort where you have to think I have to make my purpose greater than my fears. Yes. And, and exactly, Shelley. And, and thank goodness that you did. Right. Because through your willingness to, to go within and, and, overcome the, that old conditioning because that's all it was right? it was just a misunderstanding of a young mind that didn't know any better I made conclusions about about herself or myself um because yeah, we all do but but those conclusions are not based on reality they're just misunderstandings because if we look at you at you objectively it's like wow of course look at how, how personable and how comfortable and how beautiful and how how brilliant she is and how she you know it's like of course she's doing what she should be doing but, but in your willingness to, to go, to put yourself through that journey of transformation, not only does it, did it free you, right, and step more fully into your own potential and, and, and that ability to step into your purpose more fully, but in the process, how many lives are you touching? Are you impacting because of your willingness? So thank you. Yeah, I think I did have to make best friends with my seven-year-old self, though, Christian, if I'm honest. I think, I think my seven-year-old self still saw me at primary school have to stand up, you know, like one day of the week and read out a horrible poem or something. Yeah. <laughs> and it is, isn't it, getting the adult self to understand the younger self. I'm like, you've got this, come on. <laughs> I know, I know. I get to my heart goes out to you because I relate. That's how I was. I was painfully, painfully shy. I was okay one-on-one, -on -one, but if you added a third human, clammed up. Yeah. My mum will remember that I, she used to have to come and get me. I think I'm sure it was a Tuesday, but I don't know, because obviously it was 40 years ago. But she had to come and get me because I was just getting such a pickle about having to stand up to read these like four lines of a poem, which felt like <laughs> war and peace to me. Do you know what I mean? And I always needed airlifting out the primary school at the time. And then, as you say, it is that I'm not here to read a poem out as my seven year old self. I've got a greater purpose. And it is finding that power, the positive power. Yes. And going for it. No matter what the outcome, do you know what I mean? I think that's the other thing that you said earlier, we have fear of failure, but we also have fear of success. But I think as long as we're acting on that fear, yes, just go for yeah. it. Yeah, a lot of people do. It's, you know, it's, and that one's harder to understand. But, but you know, I do retreats on, on personal empowerment and women's empowerment and life purpose, um, relationships. And there are quite a few people who have that 
fear of success. Like I think more have a fear of failure, but there's a substantial number who have that fear of success. And I think at the core of that is like, oh my God, like if I really do land this, then what, right? Then, then I'm accountable. Then I have to keep showing up. Then what's next after that? And then I can't hide anymore. Um, and, and for some of us, that's, that's a scary thing. And, and yeah, you know what we're talking about? It's work, right? It, it took you work. It took you some personal work and it took me personal work to, to, to overcome these fears of, of speaking in public and overcome shyness, but the rewards are infinite, infinite. Yeah, they are. And I think, as I say, if you said to me last year, like, you should do a podcast, Shelley, then put the camera in for, you know, comical value, I'd be sort of like, no, thank you, Christian. You're a lovely band, but no thanks. Um, <laughs> but I'm here, do you know what I mean? You're here, and so I'm glad that we did. But for people out there today thinking, it sounds very easy that, you know, you was introvert and then you was on this stage. What steps were there? Was it literally feel the fear and do it anyway? Or did you have to keep, like, chipping away at it? What happened to get you from introvert to the... Head speaker. Um, I know you had that evening school, but was there more to it, or was it really that yeah, easy? Yeah, it, was, it was just continuing to place myself in situations where I had to like move beyond myself and move beyond my my preconditioned thinking about who I was. Um, so a lot of introspection, and 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 that is nothing short of heroic. Like right? it's easy to coast through life. It's it's easy to to numb out and not feel um, and not think about what we're here for. Like, so that's why so many people, you know, just numb out with substances or, uh, you know, gaming or work, exercise, TV, all the, all the brilliant ways that we use to, to not think and to run away from our emotions and to run away from our pasts. And the thing about that, that, that is not an effective strategy because the stuff that we're running away from doesn't go away. It just, it's, it's still there. And, and, the only way through that is to be willing to dive in and to face our inner demons. And that's the stuff of heroes. Um, and, you know, because these days we don't, you know, we may not have the horse hitched outside on the armors and the demons to slay, except the ones in our own heads. And, and yes, it's heroic. And yes, it takes work. And yes, you, we got to figure out the patterns of behavior that, you know, so, so like, why is it that sometimes when we look at our relationships in our lives, it feels like it's the same boring movie with a different lead, lead player, lead actors, just, but it's the same pattern. So why do we do the things we do? Why do we keep attracting certain people into our lives or creating certain types of situations that we keep ha happening over and over again? At some point, we've got to realize and get honest with ourselves that there is one common denominator in every one of those relationships and every one of those situations. So if we want to break these patterns, there's only one way, which is diving in and understanding why we do the things we do. And that's why I spent the first part of, you know, probably a third of the book is understanding why the mind, how the mind works um, from a psycho-spiritual perspective and why we do the things we do um, so that we can bring choice, right? That's all we want to do is bring choice back into the equation so that we're not reacting from things that happened to us when we were like kids, like you and I, or, or, you know, or when some were teenagers, you know, stuff that we never healed that we never worked through. And it's still having an impact on our behavior and our relationships. Um, so that was a, a you know, that journey of going within was, is part of my, my journey of healing and, and empowerment breath work, which is a healing modality, um, that I've been doing for 30 years also changed my life. Um, and I was on a track to get a PhD in psychology. My dad was a psychiatrist. Um, when I discovered breath work, this breathing practice that you breathe in this particular way for about an hour, an hour and a half. And amazing things happen when I discovered it, I jumped tracks. I never went for the PhD because it heals so profoundly. I don't know anything more effective in terms of healing those past traumas um, and giving expression to all those repressed emotions from, from a lifetime of doing so. I love that. I'm, I'm not very good with breath work. I tried to do the Wim Hof one as part of my morning practice. And I just thought I'm going to fall over in a minute. And I tried sitting down. I'm like, I don't think it's for me. Then you said an hour and a half. I thought, I don't think that's for me either, Christian, if I'm honest. <laughs> Well, you do, this I am lying, you, do it, you do it lying down, right? So That could like, help. Low blood yeah. pressure, you see, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, you know, it's, it is so worth it. Um, it heals mentally, emotionally, psychologically, 
uh, and Shelly, even physically, and I know that sounds too good to be true, um, but you know, I can't, I cannot argue with 30 years of experiences and result. No. And I could have so many stories of even physical healings just from breathing. And the science isn't there that isn't there yet in, in terms of how it works. And to my scientific mind, you know, my, my more skeptical, logical mind, that sounds too good to be true. It sounds impossible. Um, but I can't argue with the results. It works. And I'm talking about people that I've worked with with serious trauma, you know, people who've survived sexual abuse and all sorts of abuse and rape and you know, violent crimes and, and that stuff gets healed. Yeah, and I don't think we always need the science. I mean, my husband is captain science almost. He always wants the science behind it. But some things just are. That's what I think. So he's out there with his science. How can you evidence it? And it's like, you can't evidence everything. But I think <laughs> it'll probably come. But I think if you've seen the results, and again, if someone's listening today and you are suffering, you need to start doing that introspection, try it. It's not whether yeah. science can tell you it works. If it works for you, then do it, isn't it? Yeah, and, and science may catch up one day. You know, what, mm -hmm. for example, what used to be spiritual teaching, that everything is energy, now we know, right? More recently, but now we know from quantum physics that it's true. Everything is energy. So that means that the body is energy, even though we touch it and it feels solid, that means that the emotions are energy, and which is part of the reason why stuffing them doesn't work, right? Because when we, when we get upset, when we get angry, when we get sad, one of the first things we do is we stop breathing and we well, we breathe really shallowly when fear comes up. And that's what anchors those emotions in, in, in the body. And so what happens is that after years and decades of, of suppressing our emotions, they, don't, they just don't dissipate. They get stuck in the tissues of the body. So we walk around with layers upon layers upon layers of emotional crap. And, and here we are trying to have a relationship in the present and it's all getting filtered through that lifetime of unhealed past trauma and suppressed emotions. How any relationship can work just boggles my mind because we haven't been taught how to hold them, how to approach them. And we certainly haven't been taught how to clear ourselves of this emotional cauldron that we walk around with. And so the simple breathing practice clears it and effectively and permanently. And, you know, I, the, because and, and the, another important reason why, we, why it's really critical that we learn how to do this and that and that we make peace with our emotions and learn to feel them and identify them and learn to communicate them responsibly is because if we don't, the other thing that happens is we suppress them, we suppress them, we suppress them, and then the next unfortunate comes and says the wrong thing at the wrong at the wrong time and we explode inappropriately like a volcanic eruption because all that stuff has been seething inside of us and then we cause harm to our relationships or that energy has to come out one way or the other so we so it starts you know seeping out of physical symptoms cancer heart attacks ulcers so so it, it's really like a matter of not only a quality of life it's ultimately a matter of survival to 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 heal this within ourselves yeah, I'm smiling because I've got no science backing, but I have said this before in quite a few of my episodes that my background is nursing and I was a chemotherapy nurse for most of my nursing career. And I came to realize this pattern with my breast cancer patients as we sat there one-to-one -one giving the treatment. They would sit there and say anything because you're a captive audience. So they'd, you know, you'd have to sit and stop for one. You can't go anywhere. I've got a needle in your arm. You're going to sit there and we're going to talk. And time and time again, the women would say about, you know, how they got to where they are in that moment. And as we spoke, they would say, I'm so glad I got that off my chest. Ooh. I'm so glad I finally got those words out. So oh my God. it's not scientifically backed, but there is something in it because, you know, other people will then, oh, esophageal cancer in the throat as well with another one, but, you know, not getting the words out, getting it off my chest. And so I honestly oh have God. seen for years. That's that powerful. Yeah, that you're suppressing these emotions around the breast and the throat, all those sort of areas, but always be, I'm glad I got those words out, glad I got it off my chest. And it was women who had bit their tongue or married who they said they should rather than who they wanted to and taken the jobs they didn't want to and things when they were sort of like, you know, felt like the unheard sibling. All of these things were there in the breast cancer patients. So there's not science to it, 
but I did chemotherapy for many years and it was always the same with that area of the body. There was always repressed emotions, repressed words. And as you say, it will come out at some point. That's amazing. That gave me chills when you said that, you know, and I I don't think the, the studies have been done yet scientifically, but I promise you that when they do, they're going to find a connection between grief and and broken hearts, quote unquote, and heart attacks. Um, Like, you know, like my dad, the psychiatrist was, and I know he was a good psychiatrist because I've gotten that feedback from many people that I used to work with, but in terms of his own emotions, he was clueless. So one of my brothers drowned in the Thames, incidentally. Um, I don't know if you remember that, um, that Marchioness riverboat accident some 30 years ago, 30 yeah. years ago, my brother was one of the victims of that. Um, and anyway, my father as a psychiatrist, you know, and the supremacy of reason of the emotions, because the emotions are weakness, like I never saw him cry. And so he took on this, you know, very kind of, I guess in some ways, at a more superficial level, level healthy, like, right, like, it sucked, but what are you, you get, life goes on, and what are you going to do about it? Um, but because he didn't give expression to those emotions, that, that stuff didn't, didn't go away. So a year later, and I figured it out after the wars, it was after, after, afterwards, he went into the hospital on the year anniversary of my brother's death. Um, I mean, it wasn't his final hospitalization, but that was the first time he ever went into the hospital. And and so, you know, this connection between the body, mind, spirit, between the emotions and and, and our our health, that's pretty much established. Yeah. And it's, I mean, the breath work I know I need to do. I feel that I hold myself sometimes. The Wim Hof one was just a bit too much for me, but I I do use box breathing. If I feel myself getting a little bit stressed and overwhelmed, I do box breathing. But you're talking about grief. And in my next book, Good Grief, the A to Z approach of modern day grief healing, it's it it goes from like um, when we're born into this world, into a name we don't choose right through to the afterlife. It's the whole life cycle. But half of it is the toolkit, the A to Z approach of these healing tools. And the first one in there, I believe, is acupressure. But it's Mm. all to do with the breath work in your chest. And it's all to do with breathing out. And it's all, I can't remember the, the word of, in Chinese, but it's about letting go, it translates as, and it's all to do with your breath work in your chest. That's where we hold our greatest grief. And as you said, it's in the chest again, it's in the heart again. So I truly believe that, you know, because when we are upset by anything in life, by any, I call it a mini death. So maybe it's not grief from someone dying, but it's a mini death that, you know, a way of life has died, like a relationship's broken down, a job's been lost, a health has changed. When you have that, you grieve. And we do feel it, don't you? You feel it in your heart. You do feel let down. So yeah. I truly believe that, you know, the breath work would work, not just because it's in my book, it's not a blatant plug on my behalf. <laughs> it's just, you know, Chinese, ancient Chinese medicine has always seen that we hold grief in our chest. So I've been nursing these breast cancers where they're holding the words in. So absolutely, I imagine the breath work will have the science behind it any days now. Yeah, and I mean, and that's a huge conversation. There's so many different breath practices with different purposes. You know, there's certain breathing techniques that you do if you're to to reduce stress and to fall asleep more easily. There's other breathing practices that that are faster, more more energized, you know, more energizing that you can do right before a, uh, an important meeting to to bring yourself energy, you know, to high, rather than reaching for the tea or the coffee, it like brings you focused. Um, and and here, here's a simple thing that anybody can do. It takes awareness, right? It, it, it all starts with paying attention and, and becoming aware of ourselves. So when we find ourselves in, 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 an, in, an, in a situation that's going to trigger the emotions, right? We're stuck in traffic and we start feeling that frustration coming up or we're, we're, somebody says something that rubs us the wrong way and we feel that anger coming up or, or sadness, whatever the emotion is. In the moment, take some deep breaths, right? So you're feeling the emotion and rather than like just completely reacting or or stuffing it, uh, allow yourself to take some really deep, like, you know, five deep, like really deep and slow breath. And that will help not only center yourself, but it will help for that energy not to get stuck, for that emotional energy to just go through your body, right? So that it comes in and it goes back out. 
um, rather than rather than getting stuck in the body and then we have you know we have to walk around with layers and layers of of emotional crap bless you so we've spoken about power and we've spoken about breath work what i love about your book um I'm a sucker for the word soul. So your book's Awakening the Soul of Power. What does the word soul mean to you? Yeah, and you're asking all the, all the deep questions. Um, think about it this way. Um, it's a long conversation to get into understanding what the ego mind is. There's a lot of confusion about what it is. Here's a visual to really help understand what it is. If you put a, a football in the center of a stadium, that's what the ego mind is. Who we are is actually the stadium. And we've allowed this tiny part of our psyches, this tiny part of our minds to think that it is all of who we are, right? The ego is the sense of self, the sense of pers individual personality. I'm Christian, that's shell. Um, it's, it's ultimately a, a, a huge leap in evolution where the, as far as we know, we're the only species that has a sense of self. Right, Homo sapiens sapiens can be translated as humans who know that we know. So the, the ego is that ability to reflect back upon ourselves. Both a huge leap in evolution and the source of all our suffering because that was the first split in consciousness. Right, that at, Before that, we felt connected to everything else, to all of creation. Now we have loneliness now we have abandonment issues now we have a sense of our own mort mortality now we can feel separate and rejected and alone um so that's kind of the price to pay so so the soul to me is the stadium part of us right it's it's our own piece of sacred real estate that that expresses itself through this particular embodiment this particular body I love that because I say the visual really helps me. I'm quite a visual person, but I'm just thinking for me in a nutshell, that was just like, we're bigger and greater than we give ourselves the credit for really. Oh my God. We are so much bigger than we think we are. And, and what happens is the tragic part of it is that we've allowed this tiny, tiny, tiny part of who we are to think that it is all of who we are. And we make choices like, critical consequential choices about relationships about what we do with our lives where we live you know jobs um, from its very small always limited and always fear-based perspective um, and, and so what if we were able to shift our identity from the football to the stadium and and the, and the, and the, the ego the football is always make it's you know it's, it's always in reactive mode uh, it's always in victim mode, like feeling feeling victimized by life. And if it only wasn't for for what my mother did or my father didn't do, or the, or the teacher or the minister or society or racism or sexism or or homophobia, if it only wasn't for that, then I would be happy. Um, then I would be fulfilled. But here's the here's the the bad news about that: as long as we're holding someone or something outside of us responsible for our state of being we just gave our power away again yeah what christian said i've got nothing what you said <laughs> <laughs> i was just like it is that i mean my mum's a counselor and you know i'm sure she'll say like if she saw twins one would be like an entrepreneur one would be a drug addict and if you ask either of them why did you be an entrepreneur why did you become an addict It'd be like because of what my father did and it's just how you use that part of your story yes. to create, you know, become the hero in your story. You know, it's, it's all comes down to choices and it is about, you know, calling back your power, calling back yourself, calling back your soul. Exactly. Yeah. So whatever you said was beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, and it's not to minimize anybody's pain or to excuse anybody's behavior. And it's not to say that there aren't really intrinsically unfair aspects about the way the system works, right? Like it's not, it's not denying any of that. And it's and things happen to most of us that should have never happened, and it sucked. And what are we going to do about it? Right? What are we going to do about it? That one thing we can count on going forward is that life is going to continue throwing curveballs our way. That we know. We don't know what the curveball is going to be yet, but who would have predicted a year-long pandemic and a global mandatory timeout last January? 
Maybe a few people might have in the world, but not many, maybe a handful. So, so that's going to continue to happen, right? We cannot do anything about that. But what we can do, what we always have choice about is how we show up in response to that stuff, right? And, and that is ultimately empowering. Like, yeah, it sucked. I'm so sorry that it happened. And what are you going to do about it? Yeah. How are you going to show up differently? And, and you know, there's one person that really exemplifies this for me. And it's Viktor Frankl, the Austrian psychiatrist, who spent years in concentration camps. Lost everybody, lost not only his property and his practice, uh, his whole family, his pregnant wife, gone, right? They took everything away from him. And that guy was able to say that they could take everything away from him except for one thing, the ability to choose how he would be in response. So again, not to minimize anybody's trauma, but if he can do it there in a concentration camp, certainly we can do it in our lives. Yeah, I'm a huge Frankel fan and I've quoted him quite frequently. He was actually on our reading list for my nursing degree, believe it or not, in palliative care because it is about finding meaning in life because he says something along the lines of like man doesn't suffer from suffering alone he only suffers when he suffers without meaning like why does it happen and I'm a far simpler soul than Mr Frankel and so I sort of say turn your mess into a message <laughs> just four words yes. compared to his very deep man search for meaning book but it is that I mean I think people would now start to say more like why is this happening to me and ask why is it happening for me exactly and you say we are not, you know, discrediting anyone's trauma, you know, the rape, the childhood trauma, the relationship breakdowns, death of a loved one at all. But as you say, we need to move forward with a new story. And it's never going to be the story you wanted or asked for, predicted. But it is somewhere in there finding the courage to be the hero in your story or to find that meaning, to face that fear, just try something. Exactly, Shelley. And, and that alone, just that simple shift that you pointed to, from to to from, I mean, to for, rather than what life did to me, but what life did for me, that changes everything. That's like tearing up the victim card and, and reclaiming our power. And, and there's, a, there's a book called Pronoia, right? It's, it's a great term that this guy coined a few years ago. Um, I forget his name right now. But it's the opposite of paranoia, right? So paranoia is like walking around, like what life, like, like so many of us walk around, just like just waiting for the next shoe to drop, what, if, what life did to me. Um, so we have this adversarial relationship with life, as opposed to what you're pointing to, which is a paranoia, like life has our back, like life has a vested interest in, in each one of us fulfilling our potential. And, and that unique human potential that we were talking about earlier and, and vested interest in our, in our stepping each one of us into our power and into our purpose. It's like, and, and to go back to, to Viktor Frankl, as, as you, you know, were referencing his book, Man's Search for Meaning, as a psychiatrist, he started asking himself this question, why did some people seem to survive in that most inhuman of settings? And turned out, you know, the more, the more that he observed it had nothing to do with education or intelligence or beauty or physical strength or prowess or socioeconomic status beforehand. None of that mattered in there. None of it made a difference. The people who seemed to survive were those who, won, who had a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose. And so that's why he wrote that book, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, and... And it, it just brings that point, you know, like makes it so important. Like, it's like knowing what we're here for is, is, you can say it's a matter of survival. Yeah. Certainly a matter of quality of life. Yeah. And I know we spoke about grief earlier and originally like the lovely Kubler-Ross always went on about the five stages of grief, which was to do with her terminally ill patients. But then later in life, she worked with David Kessler and then he did the six stages of grief. And the sixth stage they added was meaning, like in your mm. grief, find meaning, you know, in that grief, bring forward the lessons, the knowledge and the meaning from their life, from your life without them. And 
I think it sounds a lovely word, meaning. I think it's got a really nice sound to it. But whether you're facing your own mortality, the death of a loved one, overcoming a trauma, it's really hard. We're not just sort of going like, oh, have a go. But try and find meaning in there because you're still alive. And I think having worked at the end of life so many years as a chemotherapy nurse, again, it sounds a bit cliche, but, you know, if you're alive, maybe not where you want to be, but if you're alive, it's a privilege tonight to many and just try something today. Just face one fear today. Just try and find one joyous moment today because, you know, tomorrow's not a given. As you say, these curveballs are coming all the time. So, yeah, I just love for people to try something new this week, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's so so true and so powerful. And there's some spiritual teachings that say that at a soul level, we choose everything. Yeah. And that, so that would mean like we take that to the max, that means that we choose cancer, that we choose rape or, or you know, all the traumas that, that we all experience. I don't know about that. You know, I don't know if that's the way the system works. It kind of, you know, I can go there hypothetically and say, well, I could see why we give ourselves challenges in, in this journey of embodiment so that we have to grow and evolve and overcome all this stuff. And, and that's a powerful journey. Like, we know that. Um, but I don't know that's the way the system works. This I know for sure, without any doubt, that no matter what happened, no matter what happens going forward, we can always choose how we show up in response to that. And at that level, we just rip that victim card away and we just never use it again. Yeah, I love that. We've spoken so much today about you know breath work, meaning, feel the fear, do it anyway. But if there's still people out there who are saying like, no, Shelly, I'm busy, I can't do that. Um, I'm going to beg to differ. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you, Christian, what one positive change could people do today to start you know, going from the introvert or the trauma? What one positive change could they do? You know, the couple of things, a couple of, of, of the main message of, of this first book of the series, first of all, go within, right? Get to understand yourself so that you can, it's almost a cliche again, like you say, it's like, if you want to really love somebody or, or be loved, you first have to love yourself. Like if we don't love ourselves, how can we possibly expect anybody else to? Um, so, so going within, we can't love ourselves until we know ourselves. So going within, there's no way around that, right? So whatever path of, of self-knowledge, dive into it. And secondly, understand power, like understand, you know, why we have this ambivalent relationship to it. So because there is a way that we can choose to step into our power that does not bring harm, that does not corrupt, and that doesn't require for us to push somebody down, to step on them, to push them down, to put our knee to their neck in order for us to prop ourselves up and, and feel powerful. There is a way that we can step into our power that is a match with the intrins intrinsic goodness in each of our hearts. I love that. I love your book. I truly do. In there, you've got these power practices. So they're sort of like what I'd call personal development tools, but they really get you looking at yourself, which I loved. So obviously people can buy your book. Um, please do. It's gorgeous. Awaken the Soul of Power. But you just keep getting more gorgeous. You have a freebie for the listeners today to tell them about that. Yeah, thank you so much for, for bringing that up. Yeah, the book is available at anywhere books are sold, Amazon or your local bookstore. Um, in terms of where to, how to reach me, probably my website is the best and the best way to do that. And then that can, they can connect to my social media from that. And the, the, web, the website is soulfulpower.com. And if they sign up or when they sign up now to, to, to be on my email list, they'll get a sample chapter from the book. They're, they'll get some of these power practices that, that you're talking about that are designed to apply the teachings to our lives so that it's not just information, it's actually transformation, right? That's what brings about the transformation is when we apply them to our lives. And they'll also get a recorded um, guided meditation I did on trust, which is about our fundamental relationship to life, right? From, from that paranoid to trust to pronoia that we were talking about earlier. I love that. that. That could also, listeners, if you're out there, your one positive change today could be to go to soulfulpower.com. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Christian, I've absolutely loved this. You've got my little old cogs going. It's like <laughs> practical, it's spiritual, 
it's just beautiful. So thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Shelly, thank you so much. I've loved our connection. I loved our conversation. I love what you're doing. I love how you weave in so much of, of the amazing practices and, and all your, your different backgrounds from science to hypnotism to all these healing modalities that you weave and that you're making, that you're now using to make a difference in, in real human lives. So thank you. Oh, bless you. I may be blushing if you're watching on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Christian, thank you so much. If you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure you subscribe and leave a positive review. If you would like to create your own positive changes, you can buy Positive Changes, a self kick book from all online book retailers or from ShellyFKnight.com. If you need a dollop of positivity until the next episode, come like and follow us over on Facebook at Shelly F. Knight. Life goes on. As always, I've been Shelly F. Knight and you've been amazing.